Um, I am writing a book, The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters, Why You Should Carry, you know, should pre-order it. Um, and the more I write, to be honest, the more I just, it, I'm, I'm just heartbroken is all I can say. You know, they've destroyed every university in Gaza. By the way, the Palestinians are some of the most highly educated people in the world. I mean, in terms of their rates of college and and graduate degrees and literacy, and and Israel's doing everything to destroy that in in what some are calling edgicide. Not only destroying universities and schools, but killing teachers, professors, students. I mean, we're witnessing something Hardly truly, hard. Hard. It's truly, truly terrible. And um, I wish I had something more positive to say, but it's really. It's really hard for me to see, to be optimistic there at the moment. Yeah, it's insanity. I don't understand. Even if, if they kill all the people in Gaza, I mean, you fast forward, which would be horrific. But if they were able to successfully do that or make them leave the country, I, I just don't understand. I don't see how the Israel would ever recover as a, you know, its image. And that that actually matters because the, the you know, U.S., global dominance has been the thing that has allowed Israel to be as insane as it has been. And that is evaporating. So now you're doing this. Now you're going to make yourself a global pariah right at the same time, generally speaking in historical terms, that the U.S. is being uh, eclipsed on the world stage by, you know, more or less the rest of mankind. The West, the white white supremacy is on its way out. And they're doing this. I, it seems so... It's not just that it's... it's tr it, it is, of course, as you say, tragic when you think about the human cost for the that the Palestinians are going to have to pay, but it seems also insane for Israel. I don't understand how this helps no. them because I think that the, I think that it's there. They, it, I agree that there's a good chance we're going to see the end of Israel because of this. Because whether it happens now or whether it's a consequence, because they are going to be global pariahs right at the time that their big protector is being knocked off its pedestal. It is the dumbest thing on top of being so immoral. Uh, that it, that it's you can't even wrap your mind around it. Aaron, you got to think, man. That might have something to do with it. The timing seems weird. Why would you do this when you know your big brother's about to be on the way out the door? Maybe because you're extremely aware. And like this whole going back to Russia, Ukraine, they yeah. just watch Saudi Arabia give the U.S. the middle finger. Um, that Russia is just is is still powerful, and although Putin, because of how many Russian how many uh, Russian Israelis there are has been, I would say, he's been chill with Israel, but he's not happy. He doesn't like Netanyahu. He doesn't like him. And he's occupied right now with Ukraine, but he won't remain occupied with Ukraine. And if I mean, Iran he's accepting gets involved, Hamas delegations. Huh? He's accepting Hamas delegations in Russia. It, mm -hmm, yeah. And, he, and he's criticized the UN and their handling of, of the situation in Gaza. So you got to think, they're fully aware if we're going to take Gaza, we have to do it before the U.S.'s power completely dissipates. Yeah, they because think otherwise. that. Right. I agree with you. I agree with you that, that that has to be playing into why they're going so balls out right now. But I don't think that they've gamed it out. Just like I don't think they gamed out so many other things like with Syria, with Iraq, with Afghanistan. They've been so this neocon, which is Zionist fueled largely quest for a new American century but heavily centered on making the world safe for Israel as they lay out in the clean break document, which was written by some of those same project for new American century people. I mean, this, they are not able to game out what they can actually accomplish. And even as they have failed, they have not said, okay, we actually need to readjust our plans because we failed. It's, it makes it all seem like everything was being lined up for this. Like, why did we, because you, you think about Iraq, you're like, why do we need these bases there? They're already signing deals with, with to do to sell oil to China and everything else. What really is the point of having these soldiers there? Or why are they fighting this long war with Yemen that seems like, is it really that important to crush Yemen? Why would you even need to control that That's area that much? Now we know and why. Now you right? see why. And you see Syria. <laughs> why are we still in Syria? You know, I mean, it, it, it all is. This is being, <laughs> it, it's an insane. Of, of, of Israel. I'm predicting an invasion of Israel, and it'll be right after Israel believes they have a victory in Gaza. Because the who's going to invade them, though? I mean, they don't have a of Iran, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. I mean, they seem to, that's interesting. Turkey has a military. 
Well, the yeah. problem, of course, is Israel has a nuclear deterrent. Nukes. That's the big question mark here. They have at least 100 nuclear warheads. But they can't fire that shit without potentially fucking themselves up, which I know Israel has no problem killing their own people, right? Yeah. So that, that's real. But they don't yeah. know Chomsky the real reality. About we that. don't know Iran's capability. Yeah. Uh, Chomsky talked about that. The Samson, uh, the Samson um, option. option. That is, you pull down the pillars; they're gonna, it's gonna fall down on you too. But they may be willing to do that. That they've certainly tried oh, to see that, that, that seems to be that 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 it seems that that may be playing into some of the negotiations uh, and the discussions that are taking place at way higher levels that we're not going to be privy to. That they right. are that they are that they are well aware of that possibility and that they're trying 30, to get is really just maximum out, thirty thousand more just left. Yeah, I just people that. left. Is, people left Israel. One day out of Tel Aviv. Thirty thousand more a couple, yeah. a couple days ago. Yep, the most since the day, day, the day of the war started. Yeah. They had any, any uh, Nico? I know you have to leave. So if you uh, mm -hmm. if you want to take off, that's, that's you can. If you've got a, yeah, got you. Yeah, but okay. I was just yeah. That's I was just wanted to say. I yeah, didn't want to make you miss now. your meeting. I believe that there's going to be. I believe that there's going to be an invasion of Israel, and I believe it's going to be right when they think they've won. It's going to be. I think it's going to be close to the like whenever Russia and Ukraine come to a conclusion um, and, and Putin kind of better articulates exactly what he would like to see happen in that region. Uh, I think especially when you consider the fact that Saudi Arabia is in peace talks with Yemen right now, that isn't and that isn't really getting a lot of attention. Um, and so the Houthis and the Saudi Arabian backed government in Yemen are actually starting to, to make some ends which is part of the reason why Saudi Arabia did want to be part of the coalition to attack the Houthis in the Red Sea with the United States. They've so, actually explicitly cautioned the U.S. to restrain themselves. Yeah, exactly. which is funny considering they've been bombing Yemen for so yeah, long. But Bryce, Bryce, you got to tell me, what? how is it in Bloomington now with the uh, the students there? Because this is, that is Bloomington, Bloomington, Indiana. Beautiful yes, Bloomington, sir. Indiana. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, honestly, with the students, it, it's way better than I could have hoped for at the start of this whole thing. Uh, we just had a day of action yesterday calling for divestment from the school from all these military industrial complex uh, goons and companies and ending affiliations and partnerships with uh, uh, any company that's enabling the Israeli occupation. And it was nice. We called it. It was pretty short notice, but had about 100 people show up and we just marched around campus. Uh, the people from their offices were like administrative offices were coming downstairs, peeking out and saying, hey, who are these guys? Oh, and they were giving us like this, like a little timid solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, there was just a, an op ed in the, the Indiana Daily Student, which is our student newspaper uh, from faculty for Palestine or like faculty for justice or something, whatever, whatever they called it. So faculty are very upset about uh, the professor uh, who was suspended uh, for, you know, the, we hosted Miko Pellet here, and the, the university suspended our professor for helping with that because they said he filled out a form for a room incorrectly, and he's a bad influence. Whatever. But faculty are very upset about that. Not Some faculty I know don't care too much about Palestine on that issue, but they're worried that the university is able to summarily dismiss a tenured professor yeah. or summarily suspend a tenured professor with no process and the appeal on the uh, on the other side of the sanction being issued. So we have this coalition of forces, uh, and we also have art students, people who uh, people who uh, might not have been political otherwise. Uh, the university banned Samia Halabi, who is a uh, you know, world-renowned Palestinian artist. They said that she can't display her uh, exhibit at the museum on campus. After being in the works for about three years, they called her out of the blue. They said, you post too much about Palestine, so uh, we can't uh, guarantee the security of your exhibit. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. But all of these things, all these actions that the university has taken and the actions that other universities around the country are taking, they're really mobilizing people and educating people about the, the way the Israel lobby and the pressures felt by the Israel lobby manifest themselves in these institutions. It's uh, it's pretty heartening. And the only thing is, I think we have to put in more time and effort to make sure that these coalitions can do something effective. And uh, we're working on it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I think that the general sense of people, even university people, a lot of them have probably felt 
very cowed for a long time if they had any inclination to talk about these things uh, because you don't. But I, I think that there's, I think that they're getting to the point, Bryce, and I think you, you're you're speaking to this. I'll just echo what you're saying that it's now at the point that the more oppressive and high-handed things that they do are not serving to tamp down the criticism, but they're just increasing the amount of hatred that people feel towards this sort of censorship and everything. Exactly. People do people resent not being able to speak honestly about things. And the people that think I believe Palestinians are human beings and that their lives are as precious as any other human beings. And then being told that if you think that you're a bigot uh, right. in some way, in some kind of racist, this is, I think, going to, has been created, uh, I think it's created seething resentment in people. And I don't know how it's going to play out. And I hope it's done in a way that it preserves lives of everyone. Because I think that the Jewish people who were suckered by Zionism are kind of victims of history in a sense themselves. And uh, somehow this just needs to be diffused with uh, while preserving life as much as possible. And it's quite it would be quite easy to do if there were just the will that it that we had no other choice but to treat life as precious and save as much of it as we can i i, I think that this is going to be counterproductive for them finally at, at long last i think that it is going to be in the longer run dan's pessimistic and i am too in the shorter run but i i think these trends are at least point the way to something positive because we see now they could we could not get out of this spiral of just uh this cycle of israeli ag aggression and then the palestinians try to respond in whatever way and it's just used an excuse for more brutality uh, that cycle we just couldn't escape from but i think that there there seems to be a way that it's breaking down it's just how is that going to happen dan what do you uh, what do you think about the i know the things that you can be pessimistic about but yeah. are there things that you see that are hopeful in this yeah, no, I agree with you. I think, I, I mean, I'm very pessimistic right now about what's happening in Gaza. But no, I agree that in the long term, this is leading to, if not a revolutionary moment in the West, certainly um, an insurrectionary type moment um, for the reasons everyone is saying. I mean, uh, I think that you're looking at kind of this burgeoning movement uh, a la the 1960s that's happening, which was also focused on the campuses and in the streets. And that's growing. I And I, as you say, there is seething resentment ab about many things that have been happening. There's still seething resentment about the lockdowns, the COVID lockdowns, you know, in which we know something like $4 trillion was redistributed to the rich during that time. Uh, people know they're getting screwed, that they have been, and, they, and they're and they tired of being told how well they're being treated when they know they're being screwed. And I do think that you're going to see major unrest in this country. And, of course, now you have elections coming up in which the two main choices are going to be between, again, a dementia patient and a carnival barker, basically. You know, and people are going to be angry about that, too, like – is this a democracy? I think people are going to start asking that for the first time on a grand scale, you know? Yeah, I don't, I mean, if they put, if they throw Trump in jail or otherwise disqualify him, I don't, I think that will be damaging to the perception that there is democracy. And Biden, I mean, they seem to be making the case that you can't prosecute him for the same crime, more or less, that Trump committed because Biden is senile and what are you going to pick on a senile, a person with dementia? I mean, that's just mean. <laughs> so I think they're going to have him step down, but they're going to have him step down at, at a time when they can't have a primary process anyway. So it's going to be like top down sort of like removal of, of Biden, perhaps top down removal of Trump, perhaps top down insertion of another candidate for the Democrats. Uh, I mean, this it, it's never seemed more obviously despotic. In which, by the way, you know, it does bring us to Bobby Kennedy. You know, this is the time he could really emerge and he could really do something. And, uh, you know, is some of he us. Could. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he won't. But he won't. Good. And he seems not to want to. I'll just say that. It's, I, the part of me feels like he. 
he has something else in mind besides becoming president. And, and it saddens me. I think he could be the man right now. He could be the guy to do it. And uh, something is holding him back. You know, he uh, the anti-vax allegate. Well, I mean, he, he maintained support through the anti-vax news cycle. He maintained support through the conspiracy theorist news cycle. And then he had an opportunity to do something uh, that would really set him uh, aside from the pack. And he decided not to. So, I mean, well, yeah. he still does. He's, he still would have the opportunity to be like, this is the policy we should have. And he could he could he could package it as. Well, the Jeffrey Sachs plan, as in my mind, he'd be telling the truth. This is the best chance to save Israel if you want to be Israel's friend. But he'd uh, have to like a, a UN implemented. Uh, he'd have to he'd have to modify his position. But whoever is going to be doing this, unless they've been a, a diehard Palestinian advocate, is going to have to you know modify their public position. What I here's one way to think of it, and people are trying to figure out why. What what sort of carrot or stick is it? I mean, we all, it's not, it shouldn't be so mysterious because they control every other major politician too. So is it really like, gee, why? I mean, probably for the same reason, some combination of the reasons that they control all the other politicians in the US, uh, the, the Zionists do. But the, I think about his father and his uncle, and they had these plans to try to do what you could do within the system as it existed in democracy, such as it was, to try to deal with the most pressing problems that you could from the position of a, being a, a high official in the U.S. government. And they both uh, failed, really, because in gaming out what they could and couldn't do to be maximally effective, they did not take into account the veto power of the oligarchy to just straight up murder you. And I think that we don't think clearly about the system that we live in. When we, even, even people like me, I don't always think in these terms, because we're, we think about things of like, what should you do in a, in a democracy as a statesman for the benefit of most people? But we don't really live in a democracy. And the Kennedys, they did not, the question of like, we should do what the as much as we can under this system, but the system is an oligarchic system with the veto power of murder and fascism, essentially, uh, that's secret. And so perhaps Bobby concludes that this is something that the regime you know, which is oligarchic, will not tolerate going against Israel. And that you are basically, it is like the uh, it's the same way that JFK couldn't come out and say immediately and say, this Cold War is bullshit. Uh, it, it, you know, he, ha he said many things as a Cold Warrior, even as he took steps to end the Cold War. Now, I think that Bobby is going to be, uh, go down, it's going to hurt him in history uh, if he does not reverse himself on this. But the sad fact is that he's, that, the possibility of him reversing himself on this is the only slightly possible alternative to have some statesmanship in the U S after 2024. And that's a pretty, that's a sad assessment of our situation that that's the case. And I don't necessarily, I'm not going to try to predict what he's going to do precisely. I think I know what he should do if he wants to win, but uh, I don't know that he, as Dan says, I think he may have higher priorities than maximizing his chances to win the election. It's really it's a it's a downer. But the rest of the just because we are failing in the U.S. democracy, which is pretty much all we've done for all my life, uh, the rest of the world really does seem to be rising up and overcoming U.S. Western imperialism, uh, which I'm happy to be alive during this time period because this is uh, world historic. Yeah, I mean, doesn't it feel satisfying that South Africa took Israel to the world court and is now going to take the U.S.? I mean. It's cosmic it's justice. A, it's something to celebrate. You know, the, the world's flipping. Yeah, you know? it is. Um, reminds me of the guy from uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Flip that shit. That's been flipped. <laughs> it's flipped. You it know? is. And it's great. It's great. It's, I'm all for it. <laughs> I think that we're going to be, the problem seems to be that we are the last people to flip. And uh, I wish that I hope that it comes sooner. And I and the, and I hope that it's done in a way that's not where we didn't go to the bitter end. I, I feel that that's really what this is about: is do we want to reform this, or are we going to go to the bitter end with these this corrupt duopoly? And I hope that we don't fight to the bitter end, which could be a nuclear bitter end. But yeah, yeah. 
Okay, Dan, anything you want to, uh, we'll put a link to your to the pre-order for your book. Oh, thank Any, you. Uh, thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to uh, promote here? No, just, just look, I do want to end on a happy note. I do think there's reason for hope. And again, I, what I would emphasize, particularly for young people, is, you know, I don't know if we're going to win, but you have to enjoy the struggle. And, and I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying locking arms with people and these pro-Palestinian protests. It's a good, it is a good time to be alive. You know, just the chance to live and fight, that's something. I'm grateful for that. You know, there aren't many times in, uh, especially as an American, where you can genuinely uh, fight for something that has, you know, thousands of people locking arms and in solidarity, chance to build coalitions and fight for the greater good. That doesn't happen a lot here. No. And when it does, I, I mean, it, it unlocks something deep within all of us uh, that I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't, I don't want to say spiritual because, uh, but it is. Well, a, yeah, yeah, it is. It is because it's bigger than all of us, and we do have to understand that it's something to try to build a world for people that are not born yet, even, uh, 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 and for our children or for our descendants or everybody that we know, their children. It is a kind of spiritual thing in that it's connected to whatever is is, is most essential to us as human beings is our concern for humanity uh, and humanity going forward. So. I, I agree that it is spiritual, but I don't mean that in an eschatological way, like the like the you know our our friends over in the Holy Land. I mean, this is uh, it is a, a, it's a good thing to be a part of to be trying to do the right thing, <laughs> in, a, in a sense. Even if you're in the country that has been the main source of doing the wrong thing in global politics for uh, since the end of World War II, uh, it's something. So, Bryce That's Green, cool. thank you again. Thanks, guys. And Dan Kowalik, we salute you for everything that you've uh, been doing and all your hard work. And it's always great to have you here. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Very grateful. Thank you. Take care. Thanks to Dana Trevaria for producing this episode. And thank you for tuning in. Visit FordIDtrying.com and buy the prologue now on Amazon. Keep your eye out for Chapter 1, which should be dropping any day now. Please do subscribe to the American Exception Podcast on Patreon for first access to all Devil's Chess Club episodes and for all new and past episodes of the American Exception Podcast, including the Peter Dale Scott Oral History Series. Check the show notes for links so that you can follow Nico and pre-order before its April release, Dan's new book from Skyhorse, The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care. It bears repeating, these are fascinating times. It was really something to see Putin interviewed by an American journalist and to compare that to the pathetic state of U.S. leadership in the 21st century. Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden. Putin outclasses them in terms of intellect and fortitude. The only one of those U.S. presidents who can even superficially present as a statesman is Obama, and that is all the more infuriating because he is merely a front man for the oligarchy that exploits and dominates this country and the world. After seeing the much better Putin interviews with Oliver Stone and now this latest one, I have the sense that Putin would prefer to avoid brinksmanship and war. But if Satan forces him to play, he's going to do his best to prevail on the devil's chessboard. <laughs>